This is lesson five in our course in troubleshooting where we're building a digital multimeter. Let's go to page two of this PDF file. Take a look at in this video is section F, which is the final assembly of the digital multimeter, and also some discussion about how to use the meter to take measurements, and also how to calculate the accuracy of the meter. Go to page 23 of this PDF file, which would be page 22 of the paper copy, and you'll find in your box of parts a bag labeled section F, which has the really mechanical parts for finishing our digital multimeter. So again, please check that you have these things in that parts bag, and if anything's missing, if you could tell the room supervisor. The next page or so is telling you how to put together the mechanical case and some of the insertions of our boards and how to do that to make it into one piece. So please read that carefully. Once you finish the final insertion of these screws, if you could show the meter to the room supervisor, maybe have them sign off somewhere around here that you've completed the meter correctly. The next section talks about troubleshooting if your meter is not working. If your meter is not working, could you please give it to the room supervisor? We'll take a look at the meter for you and I'll send you an email when we get it fixed. But please don't attempt these, these tests yourself. The next section deals with using the digital multimeter. Giving some data here for different values of resistors on different settings. I'll explain this on the next page as to what's going on here. I also give a table of measured voltages and recommend that you hook up 120 volts AC to the meter. I would recommend that you not do that. That's very dangerous and that we make a mistake. We could get electrocuted. We'll talk later in the course about how to take measurements. But we've already calibrated the meter on different scales and actually once we calibrate it on one, it's calibrated on all. This meter is called the three and a half digit liquid crystal display uh, meter. And what this means is that you can go from a number 0000 to 1999. And the decimal point can be anywhere between here. This last digit is called a half digit and it doesn't go from zero to nine, but just zero to one. So all the scales that you see on the meter go up to two with some zeros after it and then some powers of 10. But in reality, it goes just up to that. What's listed in the next section here is accuracy on different scales, but also resolution. So if you have called three and a half digits, um, you have four places. And so the last place would be the resolution that you have. You could have 199.9, which means the last place is a 0.1 millivolt, which would be 100 microvolts. So this represents the last digit that you have. That's what you can resolve with the meter. Listed here is a percentage of the reading on the display, also a quantizing digit error. I'll we'll explain this in just a little bit. You have s similar types of things specified and, and some of the accuracy changes depending on which setting we are on the meter. For example, let me take this meter and set it to the 2k ohm range. The smallest resolution here would be a 1 ohm so I could have a 1.999k so that last place would be 1 ohm. The error here is listed as plus or minus 0.8% of the reading plus two digits. Now, let me sh explain what that means. I took a resistor that was brown, red, green, and gold, and that's a 1.5k ohm. You go back and look at the color code. The last band here indicates a tolerance, which means that the actual value of resistance would be this number, plus or minus 5%. The answer could fall in that range. I actually read the resistor value with the lab digital multimeter and got 1.55789k is a little bit higher than the 1.5k. I also read it on our M2666K digital multimeter and I got 1.569k. Very similar to that, but not exactly the same. On this scale, it says that it has an accuracy of plus or minus 0.8% of the reading, plus or minus two digits. Okay, so if we take 1.569k and multiply it by 0 0.008, which is the 0.8%, get this value in K ohms, which is about 12.552 ohms. If you add two digits, what that means is that you take all the places here and you put 0, 0, 0, and a 2. So wherever the decimal point is, just leave it there and you put a 2 in the last place. And again, this is K ohms, so leave the K here. Now when you add those two numbers together, uh, you get 0 0.014552K. So if you take that number and add it to the reading and subtract it from the reading, 
that becomes the range of values that you actually have for this resistor given the meter. If you look at what I actually measured here, it was with a much smaller error than this. And you can see that my answer falls um, somewhere near this range over here. So there's a level of uncertainty that when we measure something, our reading is going to fall between a range of values. DC current has a similar set of uh, errors. The errors change on whichever scale we're on. Sometimes the number of digits also. And likewise for AC current and then capacitance. What I should mention here is that the test frequency of our meter is about 400 hertz. Values of capacitance are fairly constant at low frequencies, but as the frequency gets much higher, this would be in the hundreds of kilohertz range, the value of capacitance actually changes with frequency. The meter can also test transistors, and it's really testing it in what's called its active region. If you plot the collector current versus the collector emitter voltage, you get a family of curves for different values of base current. For instance, here if I have 10 microamps, I eventually can draw about 1 milliamp to the collector. If I put 20 microamps, 2 milliamps, 30 microamps, 3 milliamps. If at a given voltage I take the ratio of the collector current to the base current, I actually call the DC gain of the transistor. Sometimes it's labeled as beta DC or H sub FE. And in this case it would be 3 milliamps over 30 microamps or 100. Now the meter actually tests at 2 milliamps and 3 volts. So in this case it would have been 2 milliamps over 20 microamps and again it would be 100. These spacings are roughly the same number. When we do a diode test, which we did earlier in the assembly of the meter, what the meter is actually reading is the resistance of the diode, actually in just ohms, not in k-ohms. There's an error here in the manual. This is done at a current level of 1 milliamp. Let me explain what's going on here. If you take the diode, the voltage cross, it will call it V sub D, and the current through it I sub D. This is the schematic symbol. The actual device looks something like this with a band on one side. That band corresponds to this bar here which we think of as the negative part of it. This is the positive part. This is actually positive material and negative material in the diode. If you plot the voltage cross diode versus the current through it, you get an exponential curve. If you measure at one milliamp the resistance, what that means is you're actually measuring a straight line from the origin to here. It gives you a rough idea if the diode is actually still functional or not. It's not really measuring the slope here on this exponential curve, but actually a line going through the origin. And the value actually here would be in ohms. This would be the reciprocal of the slope. The rise over the realm would be conductance. This next section is just showing what the meter looks like. And you can see on the dial here, things are a multiple of twos, because again, our meter can go up to one, nine, nine, and nine. And this decimal point that moves around, depending on what scale you're on, would be the appropriate place to put that decimal point. And this is where we're going to put our transistors uh, and for doing testing. We also have the jacks to hook up to do the measurements. This next section talks about how to do the measurements for different things that are on the meter. Now we've done some of these before. Most of these have you start by starting to hook things up and turn the meter on, but I like to set the range knob first before I do anything. There's no chance that I could press the on button and have this thing in the wrong mode because you could actually burn the meter out. So I'd like to put this first if I could. And for voltage measurements, we're going to put a wire and this terminal over here, which is labeled as volts, ohms, and capacitance. And that's really the positive terminal, and then the common is the negative terminal. I'm not sure what you're measuring. It's always good to go on a higher scale. So if you were measuring, say, DC voltage here, you might want to go on the highest scale and then come back down as you're doing your reading if you're not sure what you're measuring. If you're working in a 9-volt circuit, then you don't have to worry about ever exceeding 9 volts, and you can set it to 20-volt scale. Describes the procedure for doing that. Again, we've done some of these things before. The same thing for the current here. I like to put the number three here as number one and just setting it to the um, amp position before you do anything else. And when we take current measurements, we're using different terminals here. So this again is our negative terminal. And then if we're on a microamp milliamp scale, we're going to use this back. And then if we're on a 20 amp scale, we're going to use this one. You can follow the procedure here. We've done something like this previously in the testing of the meter. Resistance measurement. Again, I like to set the selector knob first. It talks about here measuring a resistance in a circuit. I uh, wouldn't recommend doing that if at all possible, but if you need to do that, you should turn the power off in the circuit first and then try to discharge the capacitors. Now, we'll talk more about this later in this troubleshooting class, but capacitors can hold a voltage for a very long time. 
The way to discharge them is to put a low resistance across their terminals. You gotta be careful because there can be an arc or a spark when you do that. I prefer that you test all resistors out of a circuit, just like we were doing before. Same is true for a diode test. Again, I like to put that range position first. If you're gonna measure this in a circuit that had power applied to it, please make sure the power is turned off and you discharge all capacitors again by putting a low resistance across their terminals. What this test is doing is seeing whether current flows to the diode. This little bar is really an indication that current can't flow in this direction, but can flow in the opposite direction. And I would recommend putting this up here. The red lead is the positive lead and the black lead is the negative lead. This is going into the common. So if we put the positive on the P side of the diode and N on the N side of the diode, and the diode is still good, you should see a current flowing through it on the resistance effectively from the measurement. Uh, if you take a measurement like this and you get a basically an open circuit, a very high reading, or essentially just a one on the screen, which indicates you're off scale, I recommend turning the probe around and putting it on the other side and doing the same test. If you get an open in both directions, then the diode is uh, basically not working, or we could say it's dead. So it's a quick test to see whether a diode's working or not. Uh, for doing transistor measurements, uh, here they recommend definitely taking it out of the circuit. It won't fit into the meter uh, if it is in a circuit, so you need to take it out, unsolder it, and then slip it into the meter. There are small holes that this thing will slide into. You've got to make sure that they get in there, and you may have to wiggle the transistor a little bit. Before I turn the power switch on again, I'd like to, like to set the meter to uh, reading the transistor's gain. There are two types of transistors, one called an NPN and a PNP, and I'll explain this a little bit later in the course. Uh, you should get a reading on the meter that's uh, somewhere in the range, maybe between 50 and maybe 300. If it's much, much lower than that, then probably the transistor 2 is dead. It talks about a capacitor measurement here. Capacitors, again, can hold voltages for a very long time, so I actually would do as my first step is I'd make sure I discharge the capacitor. And again, you can do this by putting a low resistance across it. I don't recommend putting a short across it because if there is quite a bit of energy stored in it, you'll actually weld the leads to the capacitor itself. Getting a, a, a low resistor, maybe something like 1,000 ohms or 100 ohms, and just putting that across the terminals. You gotta be careful not to touch the terminals because again, you could get an arcing or a spark uh, as you do that, and maybe even a welding onto the leads of the capacitor, and this could, could give off quite a bit of heat too. I wanna set my rotary dial very early in the process, so we're gonna set it to the capacitance region. region rotary dial and uh, the units on capacitance is called farads and you just see the f that's there before i turn on the meter or the power switch next section talks about doing some more testing with the shunt wire i've already done that so i wouldn't recommend doing this next step and lastly there's some just general description about maintenance and safety symbols that are on the meter and then a final quiz if you want to take that there is a beginning part of the manual that talks about how the meter works, and I'd like to wait to talk about that till a little bit later in the troubleshooting class, where I can explain some of the concepts that are discussed in that beginning material. So this should be the conclusion of putting the, the meter together, and we'll take a look at next are some basic ideas of circuits and electronics, and then we'll start to take a look at how to troubleshoot circuits. This is lesson five in our troubleshooting class.